Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because... They do not believe in me about righteousness because I am going to the father and you will see me no longer about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, show us that through the Holy Spirit you are within us, guiding us, so that we may show your light to the world. Amen. Ah, Pentecost. I love Pentecost. It's my favorite Sunday. <laughs> and, it's the sun- and it's because it's the Sunday where Jesus comes in and screws everything up. <laughs> he just makes a muck of everything the Jews thought they knew about God. This is the Sunday where those monotheistic Jews are bombarded with a huge theological problem. The problem of multiple persons in God. Here Jesus, who might be God, is sending a spirit to us, but Jesus is leaving us to go be with his Father. But Jesus proclaimed to be both the Son of the Father and also God, and yet is leaving us to go be with himself but also not leaving us because he sent the Holy Spirit, who also is God. But the Spirit isn't exactly Jesus, but is Jesus because they are all God. And then this function or part or really person of God then acts as an advocate for us toward God and yet again is also God. Wait, what? Confused? I sure am. And so were the Jews when they first had this theological issue of who God really is. Because for the majority of Israel's existence, 
They were fighting against this idea of polytheism or the belief in worshiping multiple gods or multiple equal gods. Their whole lives, their whole identity was proclaiming the absolute oneness of the tetragrammaton or the unspeakable word or name of God. And here comes Jesus, who clearly is from God, as they see him being risen into heaven with their own eyes, throwing a wrench in 5,000 years of the theological understanding of God. 5,000 years. And in order to combat this dilemma, two major factions came about. There were the Jews who denied the divinity of Christ and just said, we're not dealing with it and we're just going to stick with what we got. And the Jewish Christians who accepted the divinity of Christ and now wrestle with the ridiculous concept of the three-in-one God. And I say this as a firm believer and supporter of Trinitarian theology, but it's still ridiculous. <laughs> How can something be three-in-one? Right? How can it? When you ask a Christian, how many gods do they say we have? One, right. <laughs> you don't say, oh yeah, I got three and might be one guy, I don't know. Because we do believe in a one God, one God. And yet on Sundays we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We don't say God. As if there are three separate identities in which we worship. But we know they are one, but three, but distinct, and yet still absolutely connected. Ridiculous. It is. And yet I believe it. But why? Well, the first reason is an easy reason. God can be whoever God says God can be. God's God. Done. <laughs> but that's not a very good answer. <laughs> Secondly, I, most importantly, I feel it creates a very important theological and practical reason for our existence. That the foundation of all that exists was created by a being that is one in relationship and therefore created us through relationship for relationship. And that's amazing. It shows us that God isn't some dictator up in the sky demanding prayers and love from the creatures that God, the one God, created but rather God who is fully content in God's self, who has full relationship in God's self, doesn't need our love, but wants it. This then opens up the door for us to truly choose God or not, because God doesn't need our love. God wants it, but won't take it from us without our loving consent. Think of it this way. Was there ever a point in your life, maybe even now, where you didn't have everything you needed? Was there a point in your time where, maybe, where you just couldn't have enough money to get rent or food or what have you? So instead of focusing on the things you did have, you always focused on that one thing you didn't because you needed it. And that's the normal behavior. When it is something we need to survive, it's hard to think of anything else, right? And sometimes when you're desperate enough, you might resort to stealing or aggression or whatever emotion causes us to move forward because we're not getting what we need. But if you ever found yourself in a position where all your needs are met, maybe even beyond what you need, and then you give out of generosity, you don't need anything back. You might want something back. <laughs> You don't need it back. And that's kind of how I see God. God doesn't need us. But God wants us. And that's so different. It's so different to need someone than to want someone. Sure, God wants us to love God. But I think it's more important that we realize that we actually, we're the ones in need of God. And that's what Pentecost, I believe, is about. That is what Jesus was talking about when he said that it's actually beneficial that he leaves. It's because it was through the Spirit that Christ's work on the cross is fully realized among all people. It is through the Spirit that God presents God's love to us as a gift 
that does not require anything in return. It is that internal feeling of connectedness with creation, with each other, the desire to be with one another. I don't think that's just primal. I think there's something else guiding us there. Because God truly is most present when we are together. We also see it in our sacraments, in the Eucharist, in baptism. And I think oftentimes our language about baptism can be a little misguided or written in a weird way that could cause confusion. Baptism isn't the point in which we receive the Holy Spirit. I truly do not believe that. Even though the language seems to kind of insinuate that kind of understanding. But rather, baptism is the time in which we accept the spirit that is already within us. It is the moment in which we say yes to the spirit that guides us toward love of God and neighbor. Baptism isn't something that makes us part of the club. <laughs> that's, not, that's not baptism. It's not like a, a rite of passage in the sense that we would uh, as a fraternity or sorority. When our confirmands come up here on Reformation Sunday in the fall and publicly say yes to God, right, Landon? <laughs> they aren't joining the church. They're already the church. He's sitting right there. But what he is saying, yes, I will try my best to be the light of Christ in the world. For a world that still has much darkness. And that's what you say yes to. Which means that as baptized confirmed Christians, we are no different than non-baptized Christians in the sense of God's love. But what does separate us when we say yes to baptism, or really makes us a little different maybe, is our willing acknowledgement to be the torchbearer of the Holy Spirit, of Christ's life. When we look at this Paschal candle, or the Jesus candle, we see a representation, a symbol of Christ's initial flame. If you notice, we always take from this candle to light the others. And after today, this candle will go away. Because it represents that the light is then amongst us. This light that we point to, that we, that we get our initial flame from, it's no longer needed here because it's in each and every one of you. That's why we shouldn't be sad to see Christ go away, to see the candle go away, but rather rejoice that it has found its rightful home within our hearts. So let the Holy Spirit shake up your life, our lives, so that we may see God in a new way, just like the Jews did 2,000 years ago. Just because we think we know what God is for 2,000 years doesn't mean that God can't be different for us today. And let the Holy Spirit help us realize that it is in our relationship that our flame grows ever brighter. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah.